Trying to predict what will happen in the future is a fool's game. In sport in general, but in football in particular, well, football makes a fool of all of us who try to predict what will come to be. You can look to the past to make an educated guess, but even then, anything can happen. Unless we're talking about Antonio Conte. The inevitable is he's going to leave. The inevitable is he's not happy. The inevitable is that it's almost sabotage vibes that we're getting now. Never taking any responsibility. I was all in, even though obviously I knew about the potential drama that he brings. The upside of Antonio Conte is fantastic. Give him the tools he needs and he'll become a serial winner for you. Well, domestically, of course. I mean, that European record is its a bit scary to look at. Antonio Conte has won everywhere that he has gone recently. At Juve, he helped kick off their dominance in Serie A. He took Chelsea from slouching under Mourinho to winning the Premier League. And he even brought glory back to Pazza Inter. But in all of these cases, Conte has been haunted by something. A set of repeated behaviors as if he is following a step-by-step -step guide to repeat the mistakes that have eventually led to an unhappy marriage at each club. And now, he's seemingly doing it all again at Tottenham but without winning anything. Yet, of course, it's still technically possible if he sticks around, that is. Let's analyze his time at Juve, Chelsea, and Inter, and draw some parallels with his time at Tottenham to see if Conte really is this creature of habit that we suspect him to be. Let's take a look at the life cycle of Antonio Conte. Before we get to that, however, I'd like to thank our sponsors OneFootball for making this video possible. OneFootball ensures you can stay up to date on all of the things you care about in football, whether that be Tottenham, the Italian national team, Antonio Conte, or the thought of Harry Kane renewing his contract once again with Tottenham. Just download the app, follow all of the competitions, teams, and players you care about, and watch as your homepage gets populated with articles, breaking news, and videos to enjoy. Watch football highlights, you can even watch live matches within the app, depending on your geographical location, and so much more. So use the link in the description or use this QR code for a free download on Android or iOS, and you'll be right up to date on all things in the football world. Thanks, OneFootball. Before getting into his history, it's worth taking note of how things have gone so far at Tottenham. The club has seen its fair share of difficulties recently. Yes, Pochettino getting to the Champions League final with that Tottenham squad was a major achievement, but domestic form had slipped to the point where he was sacked in late 2019. Bring in Mourinho, a man who has won trophies with every club he had managed since FC Porto, and while he had been able to bring Tottenham to a League Cup final, he was sacked just over a week prior, so he didn't get the opportunity to finish the job. League results were poor, and his replacement, Nuno Espirito Santo, was just as poor. Espirito Santo had built up a lot of charitability in England thanks to his first few seasons with Wolves, taking them from the Championship to the Europa League, but he was promptly sacked and replaced with Antonio Conte. With Conte, there was always a lot of suspicion that it was an odd pairing, an odd couple. Conte with Daniel Levy. But there were some football romantics, such as myself, that had faith that maybe he was looking for a change. Maybe he wanted to challenge himself and he would divert from his usual behaviors that he has become notorious for. Infamous for. Nope, same Conte. Three months after his appointment, he was already saying things like, Maybe I'm not good enough for Spurs after a run of bad results. And as is always the case with Conte, there is almost zero assurance from him that he will stick around. This season, the complaints to the media about the squad and the backing of him have reached another level, to the point where it's accepted that he won't be around next season. In this video, we'll go over in detail the exact same experiences that Juventus supporters had with our friend Beppe from Jesus Juve on YouTube, the Chelsea experience with MAH or Matisse Armani, and the Inter experience with Uncle Sharma. All three are great friends of the channel, they're linked below, so do check them out. Now before we get into this guys, it's worth noting that I spoke to all of these creators separately. I know that the video of the interviews has already sort of alluded to that, but I didn't have the others hiding and listening in the lobby or anything. They didn't know each other's answers. So keep that in mind when you're listening to the answers and the parallels that are drawn. And with that in your mind, let's talk about the good times. When we announced Conte as the coach of Juventus, we were all super, super happy. Enthusiast you can't even imagine. But you have to put everything in context, of course. It's his first real big team that is coaching Juventus. So he, he doesn't have that big experience as a coach before that. He was one of the 
promising upcoming coach, but not the coach that Antonio Conte is today. A son, because don't forget, he has a huge career as a player as Juventus, became also captain of Juventus. I would say he's one of those managers that kind of live through the game emotionally. Like he's he's not one of those, you know, sit on the on the on the on the chair managers and kind of assess things in a calm fashion. Or he's one of those people that he feels like he's kicking every ball, he's he's involved in every tackle, and, and that's because obviously maybe he's a former player and his nature was always kind of that as a player as well. He's that fiery kind of you know, passionate type of player. When he came in, I kind of knew that, yeah, this is this is exactly what Chelsea are used to in terms of characters with Mourinho, you know, and, and that's what the fans love. The risk was uh, was was worth it with, with Conte's track record of winning and changing the image of teams, I think, was just too good to look past because that's what Inter needed. Like, we were going through, you know, we just came out of the banter era. We finally returned to the Champions League. Obviously, Split is doing well now, but his track record wasn't, he wasn't that guy to take you to the next level and Conte had that track record so I was all in even though obviously I knew about the potential uh, drama that he brings. And that immediate impact is the exact reason as to why he continuously gets jobs, why he is still so sought after by clubs. Well he also has a habit of winning wherever he goes except for maybe Tottenham but can we really judge these managers for failing to win at a club that no manager has won at since 2008? It's fair to bring that up, right? I'm sorry, Spurs supporters. Everywhere Conte has gone, he has raised the level of the team. That is a fact. I think for him, one of the biggest pluses was the kind of work rate and, and mindset that he instilled from the get-go. The training, from what I remember rumouredly, reportedly, was kind of just so vigorous, so intense, and it was like no nonsense whatsoever. I consider Antonio Conte a fantastic coach in terms of arriving at the club boosting a club, nobody or not a lot of people can bring the immediate impact that Antonio Conte has. It's crazy. Even at Inter, where he brought legendary fitness coach Antonio Pintus with him, you had players like Lukaku, speaking of the intensity of training, how it's not only physically demanding, but he whips the team up into a fur, getting them ready to go to battle week in, week out, saying, quote, Training is actually a war zone. Our manager doesn't play around. He doesn't like when we hold it in. And of course, while the first season with Inter is the outlier here, as he didn't win a league title with his first attempt with the Nerazzurri, he was revolutionary at both Chelsea and Juve previously. The start of the season wasn't actually that great until that Arsenal game at the Emirates. And then he just flipped the system. And, and, and predominantly in the Premier League, no one had really played a three at the back up until that point. Everybody was traditionally in their four at the back kind of set mould. And he was the first manager that I can remember at least to come in and flip things tactically and go, I'm going to go with this three at the back. This is what we're using in Serie A. This is what we're using with the national team on a consistent basis. We flipped it after the Arsenal game and then we just went on this ridiculous run. It was just a time where we just felt like, once again, we were a little bit unstoppable. On that run, 5-0 against Everton, you know, beating Manchester United at home, beating City away. We were just a machine and he made us into a machine. It was, it was brilliant. It was quality. Look, the first season of Antonio Conte is for every single Juventino, one of the top three seasons ever in the history of Juventus. We don't lose any game. And for a team that is coming from two times being seventh is a miracle. But I have to say that first year is magical. Magical for two, where everything is, is, is going perfectly. Style of play, victories, not losing. Uh, you, you feel again, you are proud to be a Juventino about what you are representing. We win that Scudetto. We lose, unfortunately, that Coppa Italia last game of Alessandro Del Piero in the end of the season. But we it's perfect. Second season, we win again the Scudetto, so it's two in a row. But there we start already to be a bit more complicated. Conte is box office. Conte was entertaining on the pitch as a player. Conte is entertaining on the touchline as a manager. Conte is entertaining in the press rooms as well, at least when things are going right, if you are a supporter of the club he's at. But for everyone else, he is especially entertaining when he is seemingly unhappy with what is happening at the club. The common denominator when it comes to things going south with Conte at Juve, Chelsea and Inter seems to be the transfer market. Towards the end of the season, it starts in press conference where in front of media and on press conference, he starts already with some words against a player, against the company, against the club never taking any responsibility, but it's not that big, huge of a deal. So you can even potentially agree with him on things, but he starts speaking about transfer market, that he doesn't have the players 
And that's the beginning. But as we win second Scudetto in a row, that year we also win the Supercoppa, we forgive, we are happy. We still are Juventus that is winning and we are happy. He was and is a really impatient person. And that's where he started the second year. Third year is going full power with a request of players publicly. You know, he was asking for Cuadrado. He was asking for Iturbe that became a flop after that. But also a big sentence that he's uh, saying at Juventus that became world famous. Speaking about the restaurant, he said, you can't eat in a hundred euro restaurants with 10 euro only. And when you are seeing this, in press conference publicly you're putting dirt on your club it's not really appreciated and there wasn't much of a difference at chelsea either the cracks really began to show in the summer prior to the 2017-18 season where diego costa had been told that he wasn't needed with chelsea you remember that text where conte allegedly said to diego costa quote hi diego i hope you are well thanks for the season season we spent together good luck for the next year but you are not in my plan ah man Thanks for the seasonal, iconic line. But yes, there's a link between a certain striker causing friction between Conte and the club that employs him. That player being? Lukaku. Lukaku versus Morata. And we're seeing already now in the present day, Lukaku with Conte at Inter Milan versus Lukaku without Conte at Inter Milan. And then the replacement in Morata, not Lukaku, for whatever reason, and he ends up going to Manchester United. That is the, the key turning point, because if Lukaku comes in, maybe Chelsea continue to go in their similar manner. Obviously, the Lukaku version that we've got in the present day is, is not what uh, is not the version I'm talking about. But obviously, Conte and Lukaku is a duo. You could understand why he wants to work with him, because when they work together, they seem to get the best out of each other. Well, funnily enough, the, 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 just a few weeks after he joined, I thought he, he demanded for Lukaku to join. And it was dragging on for ages, you know, United wanted loads of money and Inter were trying to push, but not as much as Conte wanted. So I, I, I honestly think to this day, if Inter didn't land Lukaku when he first signed for us, Conte, I think he would have left that summer, like within a few weeks of joining, because he was so adamant about getting Lukaku that, you know, it seemed like the whole project was based around it. And obviously you saw the two seasons of Lukaku had under him, so maybe he was correct. So at both Chelsea and Juve, he felt as if his success with the clubs prior to investing in the squad meant that he warranted being backed in the market and that he should have the players that he needs to elevate Juve to the next level. The next level being a deep run in the Champions League, of course, which Conte is famously poor at managing a war of two fronts, managing two competitions at once. It has always been one of his weaknesses. However, what makes the Inter situation just slightly different was that he didn't win anything in his first season, but funnily enough, came close in a European competition. We had an amazing, you know, it was the post-COVID season. The Europa League was all mashed up into like one mini tournament almost. And we had a great run until the final. And then there, he starts Gagliardini, who as Inter fans may know, is not one of our favorite players. We had Ericsson there, you know, we had other options that he could play. He started the final with that. And so that last moment of the first season ended probably on a little bit of a sour note. And that's when he started calling out the ownership and the directors as well. And we'd later find out in February of 2021, where Conte had learned that the, quote, Interproject was frozen in August. No point in hiding it. Once he's unhappy, there's no changing his mind. And while he may not come out and directly beef with the board members and call them out by their names, the change in his demeanor is noticed by all. At Chelsea, that's where it was perhaps the most noticeable, given the complete change from sharing cake with journalists to a negativity that was palpable. I definitely could tell in his press conferences that he was agitated, he was annoyed, he's probably like mentally starting to kind of tap out as, as, as the season went on, he was starting to kind of almost playing against us in a way. And, and again, this is what we're seeing at, at Tottenham. Now, the last season at Chelsea for him, even though we picked up an FA Cup and finished fifth, it was a very kind of like, it felt like quite a toxic season. Um, it, it felt like a season where the inevitable is he's going to leave. The inevitable is he's not happy. The inevitable is that it's almost sabotage vibes that we're getting now. Um, and, and we're seeing that at Tottenham now with, with some of the tactics deployed in North London Derby. It does genuinely feel like sabotage because of the way that he sets up um, and kind of allows an opposition to just dominate and, and destroy his team and not really do anything about it. You could feel it every post-game conference. Every, even if he was winning or losing, that he was sending some signs. These small things where you see that he's not happy, questions about will you renew 
Will you stay last next year? Where well, he's not answering. Yeah, yeah. And he's doing it now also. He did it uh, with every club where he is. He doesn't know. He needs to see. He needs to check. And this is not okay because you are actually pointing out the finger to your club saying it's the club that is responsible for me not remaining because they don't give me what I need. The second season, even though we went on this amazing run after we got out of the Champions League, um, we pretty much dominated uh, the Serie A after that and won the league quite easily. But he kept... You know, throwing remarks about, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to stay. I'm not sure about the project. You know, there was rumors that Inter are going to have to sell big players to make ends meet. And, you know, literally two days after we won the Scudetto, he uh, parted ways with the club. So <laughs> it was uh, it wasn't a surprise, to be honest. It wasn't a surprise. What's kind of funny about this, in a sad way, I guess, is that in some respects, one of the main, if not the main cause for Conte's anger at each of these clubs has been down to transfers and not feeling as though he has been backed by the club. But some of his best or at least most impressive work has come when he has had to make do, or at the very least, when he didn't get every player he'd asked for. I think from what I remember the first season, he was he, he was happy with what he had. I mean, he had Kante um, come in. There were a couple of signings that, you know, from a Chelsea point of view, I didn't feel like I was excited by those. It wasn't the, the window of Fabregas, Costa, Felipe Luiz um, under Mourinho. It wasn't that. And he got the best out of some players that I never really thought could have Chelsea careers. Victor Moses being one of them. He managed to turn him into a flying wing back on the right hand side and, and made him a pivotal key player in the team. I feel like a lot of times he actually does better when he doesn't have the resources. I think even at Inter, you know, the final year, we didn't really, apart from, you know, as I said, Vidal, free transfers and like low-cost transfers, he, he had to make do with what he had, you know, invent, reinventing Perisic as a left wing back. So he actually probably does better when he doesn't have as much investment. With managers like Antonio Conte and Mourinho, these man manager types not to take away from their tactical acumen of course but these guys who are so so gifted when it comes to getting their players to kill for them to run through brick walls that can absolutely be a double-edged sword of course that wasn't really the case at inter or at least it hadn't gotten to the point where it could be because conte was building in a different way it wasn't instant success that came in the second season and then he was gone but at the other clubs there was almost a sense of relief once Conte had left. At the beginning, it was great, and his techniques bring out the best in everyone. The first game versus Parma is fantastic. You go in, beautiful sun in the middle of August, you start having a beautiful football, an entertaining football, new stadium, you, you, you smell still the painting of that stadium, everything is perfect. We win 1-0 versus Parma, the players going to the locker room with a big smile until their ears, Antonio Conte is starting to take bottles of water and throwing at them. And they don't understand because hey, we are winning 1-0, what do you want? And he says, this is not okay. This is absolutely not okay. And you see a Lion team coming on the field for the second half. We go to the 4-0. Unfortunately, in the last minutes, ex-Juve player, Jovinko, scores a penalty in the 89th minute. And he's pissed off. And that already shows you what is Antonio Conte. It's not a mystery that his daughter is called Victoria. Victoria means winning, victory. And because he's doing it, because he's a crazy guy, he wants to win, win, win. It is an obsession. Juventus needed this. He was the coach that is going to the articles of the papers, cutting out and putting them on the on the door, saying, look, look what they are saying about you. This is exactly what Chelsea are used to in terms of characters with Mourinho. So I knew he'd fit right in in that mold and the Chelsea fans would get to grips with him. But I didn't think it would be a long, long term manager because I do feel like you've got to have some sort of you've got to have some sort of um, variety in terms of your emotions if you're going to go through the ups and the downs of a football club. And I think he he's shown time and time again that he probably doesn't have that. He's able to enter the emotions of the player and to do them over capacity playing with that fire, with that passion and so on. That works the first year. That works the second year. The third year starts to be really hard because what he's doing is repetitive. The first time that when he's throwing a bottle of water against you, you are scared. The 10th time, you don't pay attention anymore. You know, like putting these papers on the doors, it works in the first year. It can work for the youngsters, the new ones, the third year, but all the other ones. It makes them really emotionally tired. When he left Juve, there were a lot of players that said, ah, yeah. good, 
And unfortunately, he seems to be the kind of guy who, when it isn't going his way, he'll pick up his ball and go home, so to speak. It's interesting because even in winning, he's willing to step away from a club, which is speaks to him as being a very, very peculiar character in football, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm convinced. I think most Inter fans will say to you, if he just he had one more year of contract left, yes, we sold Lukaku, yes, we sold Hakimi, but we saw last year, you know, when Inter, you know, kind of bottled the Scudetto to AC Milan, if he stayed and, you know, he built, just finished his, his project, he could have won another Scudetto and he walked away from that. And then now, I don't even know if it was really worth it going to this Tottenham team. It looks like he's not staying there either and he's not going to be getting any trophies there. So, yeah, he's definitely a man of principle. He does definitely stick to his ideals, football-wise and, you know, morals-wise. And if he's willing to walk away right after winning the Scudetto with Inter, I mean, yes, some context is needed there when it comes to finances, etc. But as Uncle Sharma pointed out, it wouldn't have been that bad for him player personnel-wise. But if he's willing to walk away after that, how can future employers feel comfortable going forward with him at their club? Inter wasn't the first team he abruptly walked away from. But this is Antonio Conte, uh, the one that you see today. We saw him at, at Juventus, especially at the end. We publicly announced that he remains also for the year after. And this is already strange because it's not a renewal of contract. It's just a post on Twitter saying, next year coach, really cold from Juventus, Antonio Conte, season 14-15. Holidays are over. He comes back. He trains one day the team. The second day, he goes in front of the microphones and he's saying, I'm leaving. With all of this, you can see that Conte is not somebody that you should get used to having around. Antonio Conte is a summer fling, you know? It's exhilarating, he's fun, he's intense, and that intensity is a bit exciting, you know what I mean? But at a certain point, that intensity burns a little too hot. It burns to the point of self-sabotage, leaving you with incredible memories, but in most cases, an acceptance that it wasn't a sustainable relationship. But I think most people look on it as a success, but at the same time, they look at it as never again, <laughs> never again. <laughs> he can come to your club, lift everyone, raise the standards, get them all pulling in the same direction as he makes training a war zone, as Lukaku said. And he knows what to say to get the supporters on side as well. But there are only so many water bottles he can throw before he runs out, especially when, metaphorically speaking, He's aiming those water bottles not only at his squad, but at the board as well. It really is a shame that this obsession with recruitment has become his Achilles heel in some ways. It's as if he gets fixated on it to the point where he'd rather walk than have to suffer another season without the signings that he specifically wants. The shame here is that as we went over, he's proven that he can make things work. He can take Victor Moses and turn him into a wingback, as he did with Perisic. He can bring veterans like Arturo Vidal and Kolarov and make do with those signings, but only if there's a willingness to do so. Because once Conte's mind is made up, once that summer fling is over, there's only one outcome. Thanks for the memories, but this has to end. And thank you for watching this video and another big Big thank you to Matisse, Beppe, and Uncle Sharma for help in this video. They're all incredible creators, so do check them out. Beyond that, subscribe if you enjoyed the content and want more from me here at Robotics TV. I'm Adrian, and we'll see you in the next video, guys. Ciao!